Uh, now, so talking about your breakthrough then, I mean, they don't come much bigger than becoming the front man for, for Black Sabbath. Now, it was a real leap up for you, wasn't it, from the bands you were in at the time to Black Sabbath? Now, first of all, how did you get on their radar? What was it that, that they saw and, and managed to contact you and think you're going to be the next man? Um, well, I had an in. <laughs> My manager, Albert Chapman, um, he went to school with Ozzy and Tony. They grew up together and um, they worked together. And uh, eventually Albert became a tour manager for them in, in the early days. Lots of stories, but we're not going there. Um, <laughs> then Albert had got us under his wing at the time right at that time was a band called the alliance and we were we'd got a, a publishing deal with warner brothers but we were in the process of looking for um, a record deal and um it fell apart okay. and so like a, ooh, what happens now and so albert started mooching about and um he came he, he sort of gave tony a ring and uh, spoke to their manager at the time which was oh god what was their managers i can't i'll come to me in a minute um and he said, um, my lad's like available. And he went, what? <laughs> you know, who's that? He says, uh, I'm, you know, great singer. You know, if you're interested, let me know and I'll, I'll get him up there. Well, 1986 sort of happened with Tony doing the Seventh Star album with uh, Glenn Hughes. And um, they had some problems with Glenn. I don't know what it was. But Glenn went missing for some reason. I don't know where he went. But they uh, they put me on standby and said, we might have a gig for you. And I was like, <laughs> fuck off. I can't sing like Glenn Hughes. Nobody can sing like Glenn Hughes. Only Glenn Hughes can sing like Glenn Hughes. I was really, really scared. So I said, okay, well, just, you know, learn a few of the songs and stuff like that. And they sent me um, uh, the, t the tape of the album before it was called Black Sabbath. In fact, it was... And if you remember, if you know the history, it was Tony Iommi's solo album in the beginning, and they insisted it be called Black Sabbath. Yeah. So they sent me this tape and said told me to learn some songs. Which I couldn't even get close to Glenn's voice, to be honest. <laughs> um, and then they found Glenn, and they said, it's OK, we found him. Like, stand down. I was pleased about that, actually. <laughs> so then after that, then they got Ray Gillen, and then he left to join Blue Murder with John Sykes. So they called me again and said, uh, you better come like for a, a, um, like an, a, a demo, like an interview or have a, an audition, you know. So um, then I started to worry again because I wasn't sure what. I mean, I've come from nowhere, like you said. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So anyway... Uh, they wouldn't give me any songs. They said, come to the studio in London. We'll run you through something and let's like, see how you get on. Well, I'm a nobody. Like at this point, I'm just like, what are they doing? You know, asking somebody like me who's like not from nowhere. But the, the band were going through hard times and it, it was at a pretty low ebb. And they were finding it difficult, you know, to get people to work with them. And they, uh, they'd been you know, criticised for lots of stuff. So by the time I joined, you know, it wasn't so bad to sort of step in there. Um, but I went down for the session anyway and did um, The Shining. Yep. Uh, that was it. They gave me one song. <laughs> so <laughs> off. Um, and then two days later, they called me back and says, right, you've got the job. Uh, you've got a week to finish the album. And I went, what the fuck is going on? I just couldn't know. Oh. Yeah. So back I went down to London and sort of walked into the studio. I'd never been in a studio like that before. It was a mad, like really, really big studio. So it took me a while. But as it happened, um, the Eternal Idol, or the Eternal Idiot, as we call it, um, was already written. Yep. And all the melodies were already there. So actually, that was good for me. Yeah, um, yeah. because they said don't change anything don't try and write any lyrics or anything just do what is already done because they'd already spent like a year in Montserrat writing it and, and according to Jeff Nichols 
um, he said they couldn't really change it after that. The, they'd spent so much time and money on it, it was like mm-hmm. written in stone. So that was cool. So just do what, what's there. Um, so I did my best. Um, it turned out all right, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, and that was like a, thank God, that's over with. And then, like almost instantly, I was on the road and I was playing in a band that had carpet on the stage. <laughs> I've never been in a band with carpet on the stage. What the fuck? You know, the only really big bands have carpet on the stage. <laughs> like, yes. And, you know, people like that. So it was like a, a complete sudden immersion in a world that I knew nothing about. Incredible. Absolutely, Absolutely incredible. And obviously the pressure's off where you were told you had the week and you had to do it that way. There was, no, there was no putting your stamp or anything on it at the time. But in terms of that, how did the dynamics work then? Because you were a bit younger than the rest of the guys, weren't you going into the band? A bit. I was 12 <laughs> years younger. Uh, I was 12 years younger than them, which was difficult. And that never left me. Um, that followed me as it would. Because like twelve years, you know, it's it, it's always twelve years, ain't it? Yeah. So um, we didn't have the same circle of friends. I mean, they were hanging out with Ian Gillen and Brian May, and I'm hanging out with Fred <laughs> down the road. <laughs> so that was like. I'm sure Fred's fine. I'm sure he's nice. <laughs> I, I changed his name for convenience. Um, uh, so the gap was always there, and I found that really hard work. Um, I couldn't communicate with them on on any similar level they already had like 20 years experience ahead of me and um they were older than me and just everything was you know that far in the future always mm-hmm. uh, you know right through my tenure with with south i kind of got used to it but i never solved it it never it never they never became you know best friends they were best friends with each other, but it was like, I, I guess it was like, I say this often, it must have been like having a younger brother that you don't want yeah. tagging along. But they liked my voice. And so they, you know, they, and I was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of worked out. <laughs> it worked indeed. And just a quick question. You mentioned it there. I've heard you say it a few times, actually, the, the eternal idiot. Um, you've said that a few times. Where does that come from? Because I've, I've heard you call the, the eternal idol the eternal idiot a few times. So where, where, where does that come from? When we came, we did the eternal idol tour. And when we came back, um, the first place I got dropped off at was Tony Iommi's house. Okay. <clears throat> he had a gardener and um, he was an Irish guy. And we walked to the gate and started walking up the pathway towards his house. And this gardener was there, and he shouts out, Tony, you know, album, the eternal idiot, I fucking love it. <laughs> and he said, I said, Did he just call the album the eternal idiot? I said, yeah. He said, Fucking hell, the eternal idiot. And he went, Stuck. <laughs> you know, album, the eternal idiot, I fucking love it. Well, endorsed by the Irish Gardener. There you go. That should have been on the front of the album. Um, so, yeah, so the first album, then um, the pressure's off. You, you went in, you recorded what was there. What did you do then when you set about the next album? I mean, how did you go about putting your stamp on it? Oh, well, that's different now because um, I, I was told that I could write yeah. my own melodies and lyrics. So by the time it came round to doing that, I'd sort of got an understanding of what this thing was. And um, so it was then it was about, oh, wh- where, where do I go with it? Um, and I had, there was lots of options. I mean, what I didn't want to do is just copy what had been done before. And um, of the obvious ones, the Aussie thing and the Ronnie thing, uh, both of them are very successful. And so um, unfortunate for, unfortunately for me, I've got a power voice. And so people tend to... Um, think of me as a kind of Ronnie sort of singer, you know, just because of the power that's in my voice. But I didn't want to copy what he did. So I sort of came across this idea of doing themes. Um, Headless Cross was English history, more or less, the plague and stuff like that. Um, Tyr was uh, Viking mythology and stuff like that. And I had this thought in my head that, well, actually, you could go anywhere with this, like, you know, the shamans, 
of American Indians. You could do the samurai of the the Japanese. You know that yeah, yeah. kind of thing. All of them have good and evil elements to them. So I was thinking along that line and, and I sort of quickly got into Headless Cross, which is the English history thing. <clears throat> um, and the story really was that in the plague, the days of the plague, they would paint a cross on the door. <laughs> Not that it stopped it coming in. It was just like, you know. <laughs> I don't know if they imagine that you're putting a crucifix on the door with bright stops there. You can't get past the cross. Just paint your cross on your door and you've sorted it. But um, that was like a great, a great subject for me. So um, I, I studied it and just got into it. And, and then I found that my love of words and uh, melodies yes. really lent well to the music that they was giving me. I think they thought there was a bit too much death in it. I mean, there was one bit where um, Cozy Powell was playing drums in the, uh, in the session and he suddenly stopped halfway through the session. He went, do you think there's enough death in this one? I think it needs more death. You know, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> carried on playing. We went, what? What was that? So, um, what's it called again? <laughs> when death calls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're talking there about um, the, the riffs they provide and the music they provide and things like that. I mean, let's just quickly talk about Tony. I mean, he is quite rightly regarded as one of the greatest guitarists of all time. What was it like working with with someone as incredible as him? Surprisingly easy. Um, Good. You know, he's uh, he's a great guy. Um, he's on top of his game. I mean, you know, I love people that are on top of the game. Like, I, I don't get jealous by it at all. I just think it's fantastic when you know, somebody's doing the thing they do best. And um, he made it really easy. And and I know that that's the way he works um, uh, because of other uh, people and other things that he's, he's done. Um, he generally just riffs, uh, uh, you know, he plays, he starts playing and just keeps going until somebody latches on to something. Oh, I like that bit. Well, at the time, I sort of bought myself a eight-track tape recorder thing, and so I used when we used to go to the writing sessions, I just set this thing up and um, put it into record and uh, recorded everything. And then I uh, said, yeah, well, "Go away, but I'll, I'll just want to have a play through these things." And I'd sort of select sections and put them together, and then sing on it, and then give them a tape and say, what do you think of that? It was real easy to work with him. And um, I, I never, ever really had a problem with Tony, you know, working with him. So, yeah. So, yeah, moving on to your, to your first solo album then, um, Back Where I Belong. Um, you'd left Sabbath at this point. Um, difficult yeah. transition. It was something you weren't expecting at all. Um, but <laughs> in terms of that album that you came up with, I mean, you worked with some incredible people on that one as well, didn't you? Yeah, um, uh, that that was see that once I'd been fired from Sabbath, I mean that was just a total surprise. I wasn't yeah. expecting, didn't see that coming at all. I wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> I wanted nothing to do <laughs> far away from heavy metal music as I could get. Yeah, and so I sort of had this idea, you know, at the time we were still sort of coming off that like eighties rock yeah. type of sound, and so I thought, oh, I'll go that way. Um, so I sort of made uh, um, uh, some soundtracks for myself, and it, it, it was kind of okay. It never really flew, um, but the people on it were great. You know, but Brian May was on there. He sort of did a solo for me, and um, a drummer from Saxon as well. And, um, yeah, it, it was good. And I actually got to work with a gospel choir, which was like, it's an incredible experience when you stood in the room and they're belting it out. <laughs> It's fantastic. You know, it just stood in the middle of these voices. And like, oh, and they're just enjoying themselves and like dancing and <laughs> just really cool. So I, I did think that that's the way I was going to go for a while. But then they asked me back again. In fact, whilst I was doing the solo album, Tony was uh, speaking to me and saying, can you come back? Said, no, actually, <laughs> oh, I'm doing a solo album. Oh, all right, all right. Then he called me again a bit later on and said, can you come back now? I said, what, what's the problem? He said, oh, we're having 
the problems with Ronnie, and um, it's not going, it's not going down well. Again, I don't know what the problems are. Didn't sort of tell me what that was, but mm -hmm. um, I did go actually, and um, I spent some time with them, uh, looking at the, the tracks that they were working on at the time, and um, I, I couldn't really sing Ronnie's stuff. That was just too obvious. So I said, look, I, if I was to do this, I'd need to rewrite it. You know, and and do it my own way. And they said, oh, I haven't got time to do that. I said, okay, the best thing to do, carry on with Ronnie, and then maybe we can talk after. And that's kind of what happened. And that's how I got back into it, really. That is how you got back so, into the next album was cross purposes, wasn't it? And just a quick story from that. I mean, Eddie Van Halen um, popped up. Uh, he was involved in one of the songs on that album, wasn't he? I mean, how how did that go? What was it like meeting Eddie and working with him? Evil Eye. He he played on. Yeah. In fact, he he sort of put the riff together, kind of. But uh, oh, fucking shocked that was. I mean, I didn't know he was coming. No one told me. <laughs> wow. Door opens and comes Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> what the fucking hell is he doing here? Hello. I just don't know. Oh. <laughs> um, hi, Tony. Uh, um, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> fucking hell. Well, it happened that um, Van Halen were on tour and they were in the area. So um, Van Halen had toured with Sabbath years before. And Tony became friends with Eddie. Of course. So when they were in the area, he said, come on, have a jam. Come on, come on, come on. Meet the lads. Yeah, well, tell me first. Don't fucking let him walk in. <laughs> but then he was just, he was great, you know. Very, very um, determined. No, no, what are you going to do now? Are you going to do something there? Yeah, I'm, I'm on it, I'm on it. Um, so, um, but great. And um, it went well and I recorded it. So I have that session um, with Eddie, and I, know I, I was thinking I did tell Tony recently that if he wanted to use it for anything, <clears throat> let me know, and I'll give him all the the tracks that I've got. Um, but uh, nothing came of that, so I don't know what they're doing with that. But um, yeah, that was an, a, a nice but strange surprise working with Indeed. Eddie. Indeed. Indeed. And you mentioned that uh, you've, you've mentioned to Tony, you've got those tapes and things like that. You mean you put up something about a month ago, didn't you, saying that you got a call from Tony's manager and, and it seems like a, a deal for your era of Sabbath albums could be coming back to light. What's happening with that? Um, I don't really know. <clears throat> I don't know a date. And I don't know what they're going to put in it. Okay. Um, because they said uh, we can't use anything. We can't do anything new under the Black Sabbath name. Mm -hmm. um, but we could do something that we did at the time, which I don't get, because if we found a song that we hadn't used and now we release it, it's new. So I, I, I don't know how that works. <clears throat> but um, uh, we, I, I'm still waiting to find out. And I, I have spoke briefly to Tony Iommi recently, and he, want, he does want to get back together, at, like have, have a chat. So um, I'll probably be able to find out more then. But... At the moment, I'm like same as you. I don't really know. You probably know more information than I do, to be honest. I wish. I wish. I wish. <laughs> no, but it'd be, it'd be fantastic, especially for the Sabbath fans, because it, it's a set of albums which are really almost impossible to get hold of, aren't they? Oh, they are impossible because it's not on sale. They mm. they they don't have a record deal for it. And obviously, if it's not on sale, um, you won't pick it up anywhere. And also, you don't get any royalties if it's not being sold. You don't get any. So I don't yeah. get a penny from Black Sabbath at all. Um, because it's not it's not on sale. There go no money, but um, they want to re-release it, and uh, I really really hope it, it it sort of all comes together because there's ten years worth of yeah. Sabbath history missing <laughs> yeah. off the shelf, you know, and ten years of my life that is missing, and I sometimes go, what's there? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> And you talk about the, the the part of Sabbath that's missing. I mean, let's just for a second stop and think about Black Sabbath. I mean, Ozzy, Ronnie, Ian Gillan, Glenn Hughes and yourself. And you are the second longest lead singer amongst that company of, of incredible performers. I mean, how does that make you feel? I mean, I saw your eyes when I said it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's just a it, it's a, an honor. It's a, um, a pleasure. It, it's all of those things. Uh, but you you have to quickly remove yourself from the fan part and and get involved in the job part and so it becomes normal then uh, to be hanging out with these people and and to be working with them um, 
you can't go around, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember in Russia once. I was, I, it suddenly dawned on me where, where I was. And I was looking, I was on the side of the stage looking out. I only was doing a solo or something. And I looked across and I went, fucking hell. Tony Iommi, Cozy Powell, Neil Murray, me. No, wait. Tony Iommi, Cozy Powell. Ha ah! ha! It was like, <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> it took me that long to sort of <laughs> dawn on me. But then, like, you go, okay, 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 get rid of that. That's got to go. The whole fan thing has to go. And so then when you sort of start getting involved in the job, then it, it's easy, you know, to sort of work with the guys and that. And you're on more or less on the same level there for the same reason to do the same thing you know uh, to entertain people and play them what you you known for so um it was good um i, I do see the name sometimes and go oh that's cool <laughs> but you know that's just the, the, the young brat from birmingham you know <laughs> yeah.